Mo. <sighs> Immersive sports science. Sports science, not bro science. This review utilizes these five sections for objective opinion. See below for more. So this review today will look at the Panorama programs. The one from 2016, yes, I'm that in date, and one from 2020. My name is Mark Daly. I'm a keen athlete, and currently I'm training hard. But I'm also an investigative journalist, and for more than a year, I've been immersed in a story about drugs and athletics. So the BBC Panorama programme by Mark Daly was an investigative journalism piece into the practices of the Nike Oregon project. 2016, catch me if you can, looking at doping in general with inside the sport of athletics and linking it back to Alberto Salazar into the modern day. The second documentary was literally about Alberto Salazar's very dubious practices, especially the use of microdosing and potentially microdoping. There is a slight difference, although it's not a legal difference under the water rulings. So microdosing would be taken small amounts in order to be inside a normal zone, whereas microdoping is taking illegal substances, so not dietary supplements like caffeine. As with any BBC documentary, it had a strong production value. However, I would debate the genuine value of this actual documentary. It's a documentary really of two halves in terms of its value. Does it expose Alberto Zalazar and his practices? Yes, it does. Does it highlight them to the world? Yes, it does. But there is a major problem. Quite a lot of this is done from a moralistic standpoint, a standpoint that someone has that this is ultimately wrong and has written everything off as wrong. And as in other words, it's very biased. It's a very biased piece to work. And that's a shame because the BBC normally prides itself on not producing biased work, even when producing work from a certain standpoint. In science, we always state our viewpoints and biases before we even start to do our work. And Mark Daly fails this. Although he's clearly in the camp of spirit of the sport, any form of performance enhancing it seems to be wrong. This comes across heavily in his work and some things that be seen as mundane has been switched and spun into bad for the sport must be doping, this must be considered doping, it's evil against the spirit of the sport. It's just poor journalism and James, Dr James Linker of Australian Sports Science when it comes to scientific research journalism is considered the second lowest form of data analysis. The only one underneath it is anecdotal and he uses a lot of anecdotal research. His opinions on how he sees the world. So for instance to give an example they play a tape from what Alberto Salazar said at a dinner conference once about his views on doping. Decker Slaney when she tested positive for the banned steroid testosterone they both denied any wrongdoing. But then I came across something else, a speech by Salazar describing his view on drugs. I believe that it is currently difficult to be among the top five in the world in any of the distance events without using EPO or human growth hormone. I in no way condone doping and am glad that I never felt forced to seriously consider doing it, but I can definitely understand how a good moral person might feel compelled to do so. This is misrepresentation of evidence to elude intent. This literally means nothing in the context of how Daly has used the evidence, nor does it give us any insight into the mindset of Salazar regarding doping practice itself. He's already stuck an opinion and say that this is very troubling, this view. However, his view is pretty much standard throughout athletics. And not only is it standard, how can you gauge that, what he said at that dinner conference? It's like taking all the nuance out of what the man said. I'm sorry, but how can you get from A to Z, like this. And the mental gymnastics to get there obviously has his bias influenced that decision he just made. Has he done wrong? Yes, he has definitely done wrong. He's broken the laws of the sport and therefore he has cheated. 
what Salazar is talking about is the double life athletes have to live if they are doping and the moral obligations as well as the culture that forces athletes to dope even if they don't want to dope. During that time I had two faces. One with the person everyone thought I was and the other the person I knew I was. A doper and a liar who was unraveling on the inside. I dealt with depression, I abused alcohol, I had suicidal thoughts and feelings of self-hate that never went away. I was alone and a prisoner of my decision. There I was on a busy street corner in Madrid, hiding behind dark glasses and a baseball cap, paranoid of being seen. In one hand, I'm holding a secret cell phone with code names and numbers, and the other hand is dripping with blood. And down the street, in a backroom clinic, a doctor I don't trust is stockpiling bags of my blood, all for a bike race. This is sometimes referred to as the great moral dilemma, as many athletes will suffer what is known as cognitive dissonance, where they have one view, but they also have a competing view at the same time. I took my first shot of EPO, and it really felt like I crossed a line. Now, I'm not an elite athlete, I'm not going to the Olympics, but I'm still an athlete, and today I cheated. I can tell you. It doesn't feel good. Now, many athletes might try and reappraise the situation, i.e., if other athletes doping, then maybe I should dope, even though I don't agree with doping. Or, this is what you need to do in order to win. Like with any substance, there are a group of non responders, and a small percentage of these non responders are often not because the drug hasn't created changes or adaptation. The anxiety overpowers the effect or affect of the drug may have. This is where we need to look at the science in a nuanced way. For instance, look at this example. There's a particular bacteria that lives, and it's quite harmful for you, in stagnant low alcoholic conditions, i.e. your alcohol sanitizer. Now does that mean the alcohol sanitizer is bad? No. It's very good at killing bacteria on your hands. And if I used to use it a lot without washing my hands within 15 minutes of using the alcohol sanitizer gel, there's a potential that you may create a culture change on your hands. Now does that mean the alcohol sanitizer gel is bad? Absolutely not. This is where some people who don't look at things in context and nuance will jump from A to B and say, that is bad, washing your hands in soap and water is better. It's not. You have to take things into context. The information he does receive is from first-hand experience. Those who partook in the Night Oregon project. We're still only catching 2%. Now it's a shame you couldn't get Mary Kane's view, the sense of bullying, and there's a lot of potential, oh, there is some potential that he may have bullied people, and you kind of got these across, but Mary Kane's view of it was total bullying. I joined Nike because I wanted to be the best female athlete ever. Instead, I was emotionally and physically abused by a system designed by Alberto and endorsed by Nike. And that would have been interesting to get her, maybe some others, views and perspectives. Clara Goucher's very good, very emotional. Both of the Goucher's really. I think it's going to break his mom's heart. There's no reason for him to be on that. I mean, that I can think of. I don't know. That's almost child abuse. It's very unlikely that a, a, a 16 year old would be like making the decision to do this without or even know how to go about doing it. How would he even know how to get something like, like that? Yeah, how would you even know? It's really hard. For years, he was a super important person in my life. I mean, I, I literally loved him. I mean, I loved him. He was like a father figure to me. However, Quite a lot of the work you were doing was a lot of hearsay. He said, she this, she said, apparently so of this. And it just screamed of tabloid journalism. I wanted to start by immersing myself with the athletic stories from the Wells era. I find a series of three investigative pieces that appear in the Times newspaper. The clear implication there is that unless you're taking drugs, you simply can't compete. Many of the sources are athletes, anonymous insiders willing to talk about the scale of drug use. He refers to himself as the junkie doctor. 
He's called Dr X. Malone had enlisted the help of a former sprinter to go undercover, covertly recording conversations with fellow athletes and coaches. Where are these recordings? And why, in 2020, can we not listen to them? What does law dictate that if you want to work in an Olympic sport and you know someone is doping, you have to expose that individual? However, this leaves us with quite an ethical quandary, especially for sports psychologists, as they are meant to keep their clients' notes confidential. Many psychological practitioners now consider this as the same way as the legal cases, which leaves another potential ethical quandary in that doping investigations aren't necessarily legal investigations, which potentially leaves the practitioner to be sued or struck off. So you're doomed if you do, and you're doomed if you don't. Get your facts accurate. Get them right. Tell, fuck off with any hearsay. I want to know exact evidence unless it is an opinion and if it's an opinion I want it stated so. I was also confused as to why they chose Britain's greatest coach Tony Minicello. That's pretty damning. Although to be fair he did highlight some good spirit of the sport arguments. Can we stop filming a second? I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm shocked because you kind of go what is, what is that all about? What is, what is that? However as he's not part of any doping investigation himself or those mentioned in the documentary and as far as we know doesn't know the medical parameters utilized to improve that performance his role in this documentary seemed a rather weird and quite frankly unnecessary it should have been a good program and it was interesting to watch and listen and there's definitely some wrongs by Alberto Salazar I'm not saying I'm not going jumping on his side or anything but fuck me, seriously, this screams of the sun, the way you presented it. Presented it in like horizon format, which I know the BBC can do. And just show all the sides. And some of his evidence he used beyond the witnesses was a little bit dubious. So in the 2016 documentary, what was the first point of call of looking into doping? The time bloody newspaper so did he use any journal articles history books references uh, no his first reference was the times bloody newspaper jesus christ it was just hearsay this said he said she said apparently so another example of a poor use of science is that for one of his references he utilized and get this straight and here's why a routine check on a drugs information website. So, let me guess this self diagnosing medical website is clearly peer reviewed enough to appear on the fucking BBC. Jesus Mahoney, I know you can get evidence. I've seen you extract the evidence, I've seen it on the screen written in length ways. I know you can get these people's views and opinions, educated views and opinions, from the experts themselves to help understand it. You show this very well. So why fall down to that low level? And it is a very low level of, it, of evidence you utilised. If you don't understand it, you could have got an email to a scientist and they would have probably been happy to maybe send one email back to explain to you so you can verify your facts and results. So beyond the use of their conspiracy theories and the evidence from the actual athletes who were in the Nike Oregon project, beyond that the evidence given that was, was science based was actually very good. Pregnizone infects us inside the body, going into detail that many athletes probably and sports scientists probably wouldn't go in the fear that they may somehow be implicated by WAD or it puts suspicions on them and their views and their opinions on doping. The grey area, and there's one grey area they particularly wanted to highlight, was microdosing. To Switzerland, to a pharmaceutical company. This pharmaceutical company, where he collected a package which contained vials of injectable L-carnitine. It's found in red meat, avocados, natural to the body, and it's utilised 
motivation in sport can be to improve maximal oxygen consumption. It's very good for your middle and long distance athletes. Where he fails to make a distinction between the pure L-carotene compared to your general L-carotene which you combine Holland and Barrett's and myoprotein. And that is a clear distinction because it affects what your perception of spirit of the sport is. If you're injecting it into yourself, transporting it in, does it give you an unfair advantage? Possibly, because lots of other people are not going to have pure L-carotene. They have to have the one that's not so pure, that's not so potentially good for you in terms of performance, enhance it. And that's one of the key points to us. Athletics, there is a different level of performance enhancing. We train on the track. The track is performance enhancing. Different types of training are performance enhancing. Diets are performance enhancing. Having the ability for electrocranial cranial stimulation is performance enhancing. The fairness argument lies in whether everyone has an opportunity to have access to these, these particular pieces of equipment or, um, in this case, supplements. The same people might say, well, why don't you allow doping? Because that can be accessible to everybody and if it doesn't harm them, then why can't they just do doping? The definition of cheating is doing something to deliberately gain an unfair advantage. Why are we doing our sport? Are we doing it purely for performance or is it for the competition of person against person? If it's about competition, person against person, then the need for a level, level playing field is, is exemplified. The main argument against the use of caffeine and L-carnity is that it somehow runs in contrary to the spirit of the sport and ruins its integrity. Now whether you believe it is right or wrong to take l -carnity ultimately depends on what you believe. Personally, I believe in the nuanced fact over fiction world of science. The use of spirit of the sport as an argument is a pretty poor argument because it is a moralistic argument based on little fact than the educated opinion of a few with tracings back to the days of the perfect amateur. Now I'm not saying you should dope, far from it. After all, these are the rules of the sport of athletics and you should abide by them if you are an athlete. That is a highly de debatable area in the grey area because it's not illegal to take l carotene because it's in your diet. They had tried to ban caffeine which is not natural to the body although WADA has changed their rulings to which we're not quite sure why. Um, WADA generally are great at explaining why they've banned something but not necessarily why they've taken it off the list. And I thought it was quite interesting when they showed the document which was apparently taken from Alberto Salazar's desk um, about one of Galen Rupp being on testosterone. And I thought, yes, that's definitely, he should definitely be banned. You don't normally get therapeutic use exemptions for that. Totally. I mean, uh, I would be not only disturbed, I'd be very disappointed. Uh, and that's why I think uh, it needs to be scrutinised by by us as an independent body. WADA is not, from my own experience, an, an independent organisation. They create the laws for the sport and therefore in terms of doping, in terms of Olympic sports, therefore they are not an independent organisation. Congratulations on your tour performance and you're also riding in the Tour of Ireland next week. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, best of luck and I'll, you. I'll see you on the road. Yeah. Yeah. Starstruck. Not my finest moment as a journalist. When the truth came out about Armstrong, I was devastated, but it didn't diminish my love for sport. In this journey, I've learned drug testing alone isn't enough to keep sport clean. My investigation would have got nowhere without the testimony of the athletics insiders who spoke out. I'll look at sport with different eyes now. But I'm sure of one thing, I have an even greater respect for those athletes who choose to compete clean. The penultimate message before we head on to the synopsis, what Daly said there was a very powerful summing up message. I don't think there are many people who would really disagree with him. As Mini Cello stated, it's how we treat people. And this is one of the golden messages that I got from this documentary, although he didn't necessarily mean it to be that concern that we were putting my body at risk. He would repeatedly tell me, 
you need to commit, you need to believe in this program or I'm not gonna coach you. Uh, the, one of the first interventions that I did was get on to thyroid medication, meaning the amount that is given to someone whose thyroid does not work at all. So within a few weeks, uh, I could feel jittery. I could feel my heart beating like louder and faster. I was just uneasy, as tired or more tired than before. It just, and, and, and mentally I was um, distraught, but it, it just felt horrible. The hardest for me was that Alberto never admitted that he did anything to harm me. The first rule of the water code is the protection of athletes. In an elite structure, as an elite athlete, you are potentially more vulnerable, more vulnerable to those around you because you have an innate desire to win. We don't know the true figures, but we believe that somewhere between about 80% of athletes are potentially vulnerable because they have an implicit attitude towards doping. Your implicit attitude doesn't necessarily mean you explicitly do that action though, however. The protection of the athlete, protecting them physically, also mentally, and from the systems around them that may try and exploit them, either for monetary gain or through power, or for another reasons like nationalistic ideology. Such examples of the abuse of power for the exploitation of the athletes include the East German scandal and also more recently the US Postal Service team with Lance Armstrong. This documentary also highlights the importance of whistleblowers and water in the past has taken a no-nonsense, no-tolerance approach especially to whistleblowers. They've often seen them as just your doper, therefore you should receive any punishment against you. And that has kind of scared many whistleblowers from blowing the whistle. Studies by Kelsey Erickson, one of the very reasons why he even started this YouTube channel, offers up an ethical dilemma. Should I blow the whistle and potentially expose all my friends and put harm upon them? Or do I just merely toe the line? knowing that my performance will ultimately improve as a result, potentially. To many athletes, they see this as a must-do. However, it's a lose-lose situation in their mind. They lose their rights as an athlete to compete, but at the same time lose their dignity as an athlete who has came out, who has exposed their friends and have lost friends in the process. In highly patriotic countries, a sense that they are traitors, they are betraying their nation, and as a result, none of them now feel safe. Luckily enough, as a of this year, WADA has put in processes to allow for whistleblowers. However, it would be interesting to see whether they follow through to the exact extent or whether they carry on the same old line that you're a whistleblower and therefore as a grass of a doper you should be treated with full hostility. The first documentary did that although his style of documentary is very tabloid and therefore he is, in my opinion, his credibility is now poor. A new person to this and don't quite understand the information being presented to you in its full depth and details, then you may think, oh wow, this is really good. But from a scientific point of view, the pre evidence he presented in terms of it being unbiased was not the case. Although the evidence he did show was very good, very in-depth and gave us something we didn't quite know and, it, and from my point of view I found the documentary very interesting. I also found the second documentary about Mo Farah also very interesting. However, the documentary followed the same formats and very poor presentation of information to argue a point of view and it should have, uh, it should have been a little bit more nuanced and in context some of the things. If he said that this is a regular dietary supplement you can get from Holland and Barrett's, people might have changed their opinion on some of the information being presented rather than the very tabloid format this guy likes to use. It did highlight good points surrounding how the techniques utilised were a grey area. However, it relied on much sceptical evidence beyond the testimonies of the Nike Oregon Project athletes. This really challenged the credibility of the program. Panorama and the BBC in general are known and specialised in producing content that follows the middle of road policy and is not biased. However, Panorama had got it wrong in this case and balanced their programmes towards sensationalism. This is not to say the programme was poorly researched. Not at all. The information process gathering was brilliant. However, the judgments made and how it was shown seemed almost V-shred meet the Sun style reporting. No, let me take that back. 
It was Jim Stepani being selective with the truth, choosing facts to argue that your point and ignore any nuance, just minus the selling because you know it's the BBC. Some of the evidence stated had no way of being verified, such as the supposed time recordings. This, like Fatopia 2, which I reviewed before, straddled the border of defamation, this time more masterfully. To the uneducated on the matter of Mo Farah's incident, this may seem like a scandal of epic proportions. However, to an educated athlete or individual who understands supplementation, this was a nothing story about a common supplement with the exception of the use of needles to administer pure L-carnitine, something that cannot be bought by the average person. All in all, I give this documentary a 77.8.